the the internet is more surveilled than even anyone any one of us thought it is and it's not just like paranoia about government surveillance it's like there's corporate surveillance too I'm Alisa, I'm here from Newspeaks from the Logan Symposium and I'm talking now to David Mirza Ahmed, the president of Subgraph, which is an open source security company. Could you just explain in a few words what is Subgraph OS, what sure. is its main goal? Yeah. Uh, so Subgraph OS is something we call an adversary resistant computing platform. It's designed to be easy to use, uh, but the reason why you'd use it is because you're concerned about getting your, your computer compromised by attackers who are out there on the internet because we believe the internet's a very hostile place and there are people being targeted uh, who need something like what we offer. Who could or should use Subgraph? Is it basically for everyone or is it for yeah. journalists, for example? We are designing Subgraph OS to be usable by anybody. So usability for us, uh, ease of use, is as important uh, a goal as security is because if it's awkward to use, uh, nobody's going to use it. Um, we are targeting uh, groups of users who face specific threats that we know about. So, yeah, we are targeting high-risk users, journalists, dissidents, pol political activists, uh, minority leaders, uh, and other individuals, but we're really designing for, it, for everybody. And you created Subgraph OS as an open source software, and as yeah. far as I understood, your company thinks that this is the only way to provide security, but like most of the normal users will use proprietary software. Some of the proprietary uh, operating systems have advanced security features in them. The problem with, with, those, with those operating systems is that they come from entities where they're distributed in binary code only, they get updates automatically, and, and if, you are, if you're an American citizen or if you're in a Five Eyes country or even if, uh, if you're in a NATO country, say, if you're in, a, in some part of the world where you're protected by the laws that govern these corporations, then their activities should be lawful. But if you're outside of that, you can't trust the software at all. Um, because these, you know, these, co these companies can be coerced into introducing backdoors, and it's, it's actually been found that there have been backdoors recently in some very, very widely used high-profile software that is proprietary. And we think that not only being open source is important, so the community can look at the source code to find vulnerabilities and backdoors, but that a process exists that we call reproducible builds to ensure that the source code matches the the programs that you have, the binary code that you have, that you actually install on your computer, because most of the time you don't install source code, you install source code that gets turned into a program through a process called compilation, compiling. So what I'm saying there is that open source is good, but it's not enough. You also need to have some process to make sure that the source code actually is the source code of the program you have. In your talk, well, Jacob Applebaum was saying that software is a beginning, but it's like worth nothing without the hardware. Could you explain this to us, yeah. what he meant by this? Yeah, so even if you have open hardware, which I think we, we, I agree we need, you still have the problems of software vulnerabilities, and these are what's being exploited. So when I gave my presentation yesterday, I, I, I mentioned those news articles, in every single one of those cases, it was not a hardware backdoor, it was not a hardware vulnerability being exploited. These are classic software security vulnerabilities. That's the real threat. That's, you know, if there is a, an, a sophisticated hardware attack related to, say, some hypothetical backdoor capability in an Intel processor, the people who can use that are small relative to all of the bad guys, all of the adversaries out there who can exploit the classic software vulnerabilities. So we need to deal with both problems, but the software threat is, in my opinion, the more realistic threat for the, for the journalist in the field or for the investigative reporter or for the, the dissident, you know, there, the attacks today look like I open my computer, I get an email, it says that uh, it, it's a document I need to read, I open it and suddenly my computer's compromised. That's how it happens, like almost 100% of the time. That's, the, that's what we're addressing with Subgraph. When it comes like from the journalists, from the targets to normal users, do you think that everyone should surf the internet anonymously? The, the internet is more surveilled than even anyone, any one of us thought it is. And it's not just like paranoia about government surveillance. It's like there's corporate surveillance too. The, the internet, the web sucks to use. Like you go to any website, like let's say you, 
one day are just curious about some shoes that you, you saw. So you go to the shoes website. For the next two months, you see ads for the shoe website everywhere, on every site you visit. And that, there's something really creepy about that. So this has nothing to do with government surveillance. This has to do with the internet not being a decentralized web of independent autonomous users. So every little thing that you do gets stored and saved somewhere. We have to assume forever. That data is there. And it's a history of your thoughts. It's a, it's a history of, your, of, of the things you wanted at some point in time, of your interests. More people should know that. More people should know that whatever they put not just into a social network, but like just the things they do on the internet just get saved uh, forever. And I think if more people knew that, they would be more open to browsing generally with Tor. But doesn't, on the other hand, more anonymization in the internet makes it easier for criminals, for example, to use it? Uh, right now in Subgraph, everything goes through Tor. You know, Subgraph is not an anonymity project. It's, a, it's actually a security project. So. We'll prioritize security over anonymity, but we'll always support anonymity. So let me give you an example of why Tor has to exist. Subgraph um, wrote something called Orchid, which is the only other Tor client other than the main one. And the reason why we wrote it is because there's, a, there's an, an application called Martis, which is a human rights data gathering tool. So it's used by people working in like the field in different countries, uh, crisis areas, politically tense areas, conflict areas, and they, they need a way to collect all their data, and then they need, they, they're working in extremely hostile networks where, where those governments are, are trying to spot, are trying to find. So they needed a way to integrate Tor into their tool. I mean, they need Tor, they need the strong anonymity properties of Tor, and, and that is an unambiguously positive application of Tor that not many people know about. Not just talking about surveillance programs, we we're talking about being involved in deciding who to kill and in killing people and in torturing people, and that people are actually openly and publicly talking about this in ways that are actually not that difficult to detect.